The metaverse is emerging as the next big technology platform and promises to be the next frontier for human experiences on the internet. Into the Metaverse covers companies, technologies, and trends that are bringing these promises to life. Join creator and host Jonathan Ross Friedman, founder and CEO of Super Social, as he interviews the brilliant minds that are building, shaping, and investing in the Metaverse. Welcome to Into the Metaverse. I don't even remember what number of episodes, but it's a lot. And I'm so excited to have Kathy Heckel joining me today. Uh, Kathy is known as the godmother of the Metaverse. Ever since Kathy was anointed as godmother of the metaverse, and today a lot has happened. A lot has happened in the metaverse. A lot has happened on the internet. A lot has happened for Kathy. And so I thought this is a wonderful opportunity, Kathy, to come here and have a, fun, a wonderful chat. But before we jump into anything, first and foremost, like for those who don't know for some reason, just tell us in, in a couple of minutes, who is Kathy? Wow, that's that, you, when you sent me the questions, I saw that one and I was like, oh my gosh, that's like a whole episode. Um, but for people that don't know me, uh, my name is Kathy Hackle. I'm a tech and gaming executive. I am, as you mentioned, known in tech circles as the godmother of the metaverse. I think really important, I've had a very successful career in tech, um, despite being a woman. <laughs> so I always, you know, make sure people know that because it's, uh, it's been, definitely been an uphill battle. But excited to be very successful. I'm also a uh, the mom to three Gen Alpha children, who are the basis for everything I do. The best windows I have into the future, and one of the reasons I feel like I've been successful is because I've been able to understand their world. And yeah, I mean, I've founded companies, I've sold companies, I've worked with some of the world's largest brands like Ralph Lauren, you know, Louis Vuitton, Nike, and everything. But I would say. Being a mom of three Gen Alpha children, uh, being a you know a successful executive female, kind of pretty rounds it up, and, and just an overall kind of you know yeah kind of an explorer at heart. I like exploring everything. I like exploring the world, but also the virtual world. So, all right. So, Kathy, the explorer, <laughs> with your explorer hat in mind, what got you so excited about virtual worlds, metaverse, and 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 what makes you still excited about the category? First of all, I think the most interesting thing, one of the things that I've drawn from over the last couple of years is understanding at a basic level that for, let's say, older millennials and up, um, so older generations after millennials, their reality and perception of reality of what is real, right, is very much grounded in the physical world. Whereas when I look at Gen Z, not all Gen Z, but younger Gen Z and definitely Generation Alpha and Generation Alpha for those that might not know are children being born in 2010 and still being born, right? So the children are millennials of sorts. I think for younger Gen Z and Gen Alpha, that perception of reality spans both the virtual and the physical, right? So that idea and that concept that, you know, it it happened in the virtual space, it is real to them. It did happen, right? I think is a very, very different type of mindset that got me really excited about virtual worlds. I mean, I was a gamer when I was younger, you know, spent a lot of time playing everything from Mortal Kombat to Castlevania to what do you name it, right? Um, but kind of understanding that for them, it is more than just like a pastime. It is where they socialize. It is where they shop. Uh, it is where they build stronger bonds and friendships. Um, I personally believe it's a space where a lot of people meet as well and form connections. So that is the basis of why I'm excited and I've been exploring this space for a long time. So that's one side of it, right? Seeing what was happening with my kids, seeing what was happening with generation, Gen Z and Gen Alpha especially. And then the other side really came from spending time at Magic Leap, which is one of the original spatial computing companies. And um, for those in video, like I've got some of the glasses behind me back there, hold that back there. I worked at Magic Leap for a little over two years as an enterprise strategist um, really early on in the spatial computing <laughs> kind of world. And... The things that I learned there um, as part of being in such a forward thinking company of what the metaverse, uh, the concept of the metaverse, right, is in the concept of virtual and physical merging together, really kind of created that vision of combining what I was seeing in the gaming space and also what I had lived at Magic Leap and bring it together and understand this is where we're heading. This is where we're going. Physical and virtual will, will merge. And that's kind of what really got me excited and has really, you know, been the the catalyst i think for a lot of the work i've done over the last couple of years so let's talk about magically for a second because it's such yeah. a fascinating story and by the way as a side note i'm gonna have rebecca Birkin soon on the podcast very excited oh. to have her 
we were there at the same time so and i know i know know each other so (laughs) and she's a clamina one now with With neil stevenson Stevenson, who was also at magic leap we were all there at the same time so exactly so What's the, I, I don't, and I don't want to get into like, why it didn't work. There's a lot of case study I've been reading so far, but magically, and, 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 and of course, you know, the most kind of, uh, one of the intriguing points of like how really magically it was the, the, the innovator of, of, a, yeah. of what is now called spatial computing and talking about spatial computing. But, you know, it's one thing when a magic leap says it, and, and it's a different thing when Apple kind of quote unquote defines a new category <laughs> called spatial computing, right? What is the one fundamental thing being part of that company, you know, with folks like Rebecca, Neil, yeah. but really Ronnie Abovitz, the founder yeah. and the inventor, what's the one fundamental thing that you remember from like Ronnie talking about mm. the future and what Magic Leap as a, as, a, as a brand, as a technology company envisions the future to be? I think the time I worked there, when I was there, we really thought it was the next Apple. Right. So when you were walking around the office surrounded by amazing people, I mean, Rebecca, Neil, Roni, you know, John Gata, like we all had a clear vision that this was part of the future, that we were building the future. Right. So I think that ethos of understanding we're early, but we're building this for the future, understanding that there's got to be a better way for technology to, to exist. Right. Rather than humans adapting to technology, which would which, which is what we've been doing for, you know, for a long, very long time. It was more about technology adapting to the human. So I think those were some of the things. And I think just that mentality, uh, once again, I'm an explorer at heart, going somewhere where you're able to explore, where you're able to say, I have a crazy idea. I think we can do this, right? Definitely, definitely was one of the highlights. Um, they've come, as a company, they've changed a lot, obviously. Um, they've evolved, you know, um, I think they're moving away from hardware, more into software uh, right now. But I think the time I was there was such a special time because we all believed in the promise of the company. We all believed in what we were building. And when you have that type of synergy among one of the world, some of the world's top creatives and top thinkers, it felt unstoppable. So I think I've taken that with myself of like, you know, think, think future, think future forward. What is, you know, basically it's that concept of making the impossible possible. You can create that. You can actually do it. Great kind of springboard to going back to the conversation about the metaverse. And I think one of the things that I've noticed about you over the last few years that we know each other is, you know, being able to, you know, quickly and rapidly identify and jump on the wagon of new shifts in computing technology, et cetera. You know, I think when we met, you were very still very heavily involved in, in mixed reality and virtual reality, yeah. obviously on the back of your work with Magically. You know, interestingly enough, that now is, again, kind of a very hot category. But still, I think a lot of people, even Apple themselves, recognize that we're still very, very, very early, very early. In, the adoption, in the adoption of something that could become, you know, quite meaningful in the world of consumer technology. And then we had the hype of the NFTs and the crypto days. And now we have AI. I want to bring it all together and ask the following question. When you think about all of those things in your mind, are they all pushing us in one direction as a inflection point of multiple technologies that ultimately are about shaping the next era of the internet? Or do you think each of those are in their own right are actually making a fundamental difference, not just on the internet Mm -hmm. and technology world, but actually transforming everything around us, life, society, business, et cetera. So my answer to that is yes and yes. <laughs> Both yeses in the sense that you cannot take this moment, especially if we talk about AI, right? Everything that's happening with AI over the last two years, year, year and a half, you cannot take this moment without understanding that what we are facing right now is an inflection point of tech convergence, right? To me, the key word here is convergence. All these technologies accelerating at a rapid pace, kind of coming together, and where does that lead us, right? Where does that take us? So, so I think it's a combination of that. It's a combination of understanding that throughout history, especially in the technological history, right, there have been these points of convergence. Like the mobile, when mobile really launched, and you had these points of convergence, the Ubers of the world, the Airbnbs of the world, right, they were created. We are at this moment again, early, early, right, where you have another point of tech convergence 
and you have an opportunity to build all these amazing new things that will create the Ubers and the Airbnbs of tomorrow. So that's one point. That being said, each one of these different types of technologies is having its own moment. Some were in uh, evolutionary phase for a long time, like AI. Now it's in this revolutionary phase, right? Um, when you look at maybe, you know, spatial web or some of these things, like it's more an evolutionary phase. We haven't hit that uh, revolutionary moment yet, right? It's coming, but it's really early. So I think what I do is I take a step back and I say, how do these all work together? What has led us to this moment where generative AI is really the focus of what a lot of people are thinking about, right? When it comes to tech, but what does it mean right now? What does it mean in the future? What does it mean for the future of all these technologies converging together? So a lot of the work that I've been doing over the last, I would say six to seven months has been around understanding what comes after mobile computing, right? And that in my perspective is spatial computing, uh, which is a 3D centric, an evolving 3D centric form of computing that at its core uses AI, computer vision, mixed reality, and other technologies to seamlessly blend virtual experiences and content in someone's physical world. It in essence expands computing into the physical world and it, and by doing that, it changes human to human communication, just like the mobile computing revolution did. And it also changes human computer interaction because you're starting to bring computing into the physical world. It needs to understand the physical world and technology. That's where this thing gets unlocked. Technology starts to adapt to us, not us adapting to technology, right? My biggest, biggest example is we all live through this rectangle, like, you know, go to Beyonce, Taylor Swift concert. Everyone's like this, like we're living through this and it is limiting. I look forward to the day when all these technologies converge and we don't have to live through a rectangle. Maybe it's glasses, maybe it's contacts, maybe it's VCI, maybe it's headphones, hardware is still being resolved, but there's gotta be a better way for us to interact with this virtual content that is a daily part of our lives. Um, so yeah, like that's kind of where I'm, where I'm at in thinking through this. So the answer is yes and yes. I don't think it's either or. Yeah, and and look, I think we're we're there are so many directions of where we can go. I think what's what where we can be deterministic is in the fact that technology is is, is around us. We're going to access yeah. it ever more than ever before. And again, if you look at futuristic films, not just Ready Player One, which is kind yeah. of the poster child example of mixed reality, but also if you look at Blade Runner, right? It's like there's mm -hmm. always it, it's just everywhere. And actually, if anything it interacts in a very seamless way. You jump from one device to another device. And I don't know how long we're going to live through a rectangle. Maybe mm -hmm. it's, we live through a rectangle that connects to everything else and it continues yeah. to be the, the brain of the ecosystem. Maybe not. Maybe it's glasses. Maybe it's brain implants in our, in our, in our ear. Mm -hmm. Like, who knows, right? But what's certainly true, and I, I agree with your hypothesis, of all of those things are converging. And I think it's beautifully yeah. said the key word here is convergence. And that's why when a lot of people, I think at the beginning of last year, and certainly again in this year, were like, oh, the metaverse is dead. Now it's all about AI. Oh, yeah. this is dead now. And it's funnily how even blockchain, NFTs, with all of the negative, negative sentiment around these technologies, they're as big as ever in terms of investments. Mm -hmm. NFTs for sure less, right? And And... And I think there is a lot of challenges with NFTs in terms of are there securities or not? I'm sure you've seen now the SEC is going after uh, OpenSea as well. So there's yeah. a lot of question because when you touch consumers, it becomes more sensitive. But there is no doubt that there is a lot of work happening at the infrastructure level. You're yeah. seeing companies like Mythical, like Animoca, continuing to make major investments. So it's this, this is not dead. And in between blockchain and crypto and generative AI, uh, autonomous AI, which is the next wave, and virtual mm -hmm. world and gaming. It's kind of feel like a mishmash. And I totally get why people are so like overwhelmed and confused because it's like, wait, yeah. okay, it's AI now. Metaverse is oh. dead. But actually, it's not. All of it's those not. technologies yeah. are going to ultimately enable the next era of technology of the internet. And, and, and it all fits nicely. And so I want to ask you something about, because you are talking to so many people, so many yeah. companies as part of your work and, and the areas of your involvement, who do you think are some of the companies that are doing the most groundbreaking work when you're thinking about all of these interesting verticals? Doesn't have to be, you know, new emerging startups. Yeah. Could also be like big, massive companies that may not have been considered as innovators. I mean, I'll say some up and coming ones and definitely, you know, obvious ones like 
I think meta is still, in my perspective, from a real, real, reality labs perspective. So I'm going to stick there because that's where I know meta more. Like I, I, I'm not going to get into the social media part, right? From a reality labs perspective, I think that they have done groundbreaking work, groundbreaking research. Um, they've doubled down on the hardware. I think we're going to see at Meta Connect, which is coming up in a couple of weeks, and I'll be there. Really interesting propositions on hardware, new hardware types. So I, I think they continue to be really, um, really innovative in that space, right? Led by Boz. I think that what they're doing there is really interesting, right? So from a reality labs perspective, I think Meta is doing really interesting things. So I would say that's one. I would say also from a different perspective and some of the work that I've been doing over the last couple of months, which has been focusing on spatial intelligence. So we all have, and by, by that I mean, and by that I mean, basically we all have spatial intelligence. Like when you're little, you learn to go down the stairs, right? You're gonna fall down the stairs because you don't understand the physics. Eventually you learn, this is how you go downstairs, right? This is, you know, if something falls off the table, you know, you, you grab it. So that's spatial intelligence, which we as humans learn and kind of live with. We navigate the world in the spatial intelligence. That's an area, for example, Fei Fei, Fei, Fei Li's new company, Dr. Fei Fei Li, the godmother of AI, who is, uh, ha, you know, she's she's working on a spatial intelligence company, World Labs, I think it's called. I can't remember the name right now. But I'm really curious to see what the work that they create is, because I do think that in order for this AI moment to truly prove to be useful to humanity, AI is going to have to understand the physical world. AI is going to have to become useful to us in the physical world. Because yeah, I love using chat GPT on my phone, but I need, I need AI to go somewhere else. I need AI to actually be useful to me. And I think that's where the computer vision side of AI, where spatial intelligence, this concept of teaching machines and robots and virtual beings to have an understanding of the physical world is where it gets interesting. So very curious to see what she does. I would say those are companies, you know, obviously Meta, I keep my eyes on what they're doing. Uh, I think Snap um, as well. I think we haven't seen a lot of what Snap's working on. Very keen to see what they're doing. Um, so from a bigger company perspective, I'm really looking at those. And then from a smaller perspective, really interested in, in what Fei Fei is going to bring to the to the table when it comes to spatial intelligence and what that does, for example, for a company like the retail sector, which you know you and I have done a lot of work with retail companies. Um, what does that do for shopping? What does that do for retail? What does that do for education? So so yeah. Uh, and another reason that I'm interested in the spatial intelligence concept is because if you truly take a step back and say, okay, large language models are trained on content from the internet, content that is written, content from the past, right? What are the, and, and you know, and, and there is this moment of these models can, cannibalizing themselves a little bit. If they start to train on so much synthet synthetic data that they themselves create, there's this inflex, this moment. What comes, how do you start to teach these models further? Like, where are they going to get that data? And I believe that the data will come from the physical world. Like, so what I'm seeing from Silicon Valley, for example, is, yeah, large language models are the focus right now, but large vision models and large world models is what comes after. And those models are going to be trained on updatable real-time data of the physical world, right? Whether it's an autonomous vehicle or robot, whatever it is, that's why you see an NVIDIA doubling down and going into robotics. People were like, why are they talking about robotics? What? Why is Apple thinking about a kitchen robot? Like, because in order to train the future of these models, you're going to need physical world data updatable in real time. And the only way to get that is through some type of hardware. So very interested in spatial intelligence and where that's going. And what about brands? Who are some of the brands or the consumer companies that you feel are doing some of the most innovative work with emerging tech? Well, some of the brands have worked with you, like NARS, ELF. Like, I love, I mean, yeah, I'm a, I, yeah, I'm a girly girl. So, like, the makeup stuff, I'm like, I'm loving it. I mean, I'm loving what's happening right now with Dress to Impress and Roblox. <laughs> I'm we like, I do. am we living all, for it. Right? I am living for it as a girly girl that loves virtual fashion. Um, I mean, it's funny how many people come back to me and quote me on, to myself on, like, the world's next Coco Chanel. <laughs> it's probably a 10-year-old girl. Developing in Roblox, so yeah, many people put that back. Yeah. Wait until um, wait until I tell you off record about one of the next games we're launching at Super Social. You're gonna die. I can't wait. I can't wait. Um, so yeah, I mean, and what about <laughs> and what about and what about? Um, I'm really curious, actually, because yeah. you both in your you know pre journey and then being mm -hmm. part of journey and and after journey, you continue to talk and and collaborate with you know, with, with mm -hmm. some of the world's 
you know, most exciting brands, big brands. I think in between you and I were, we probably collaborated and worked with, you know, some of the world's really most exciting brands in yeah. beauty and fashion. When you think about the journey, you know, no pun intended, when you think no about the intended. journey, <laughs> when you think about the journey that they, the CMO of mm -hmm. said companies, beauty, fashion, anything relates to things that are so endemic to virtual worlds, identity, yeah. expression. When you think about the journey of the, of the CMO over the last three years in companies like that, where do you think they are today? What are they thinking about when they think about the next two, three years for their brands? So there's a reality and there's another part. A reality is that many of them have an imperative to implement generative AI at any cost, right? It's coming from their CEO saying like, you got to do something, right? You got to add generative AI in some ways. Okay. So that's the reality of the CMO right now in some ways. But then again, they do have to continue using regular marketing channels. They have to continue to think about who is our current consumer, who is our next consumer, I think that's where it gets interesting for the CMOs. The CMOs that are looking at new commerce models, right? What 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 is what are the new ways that we're going to do business? What are the new ways we're going to transact business? The new places where we can offer our products and services, right? So looking at that, looking at next generation consumers is really interesting. I think for the CMO right now, there is that imperative for generative AI. But I think as you look at what's about to happen with wealth wealth transfer, especially here in the United States, I'm being very, very, um, you know, very U.S. centric here. The concept that the boomers are going to leave all this money to um, Gen uh, Gen Xers and millennials, it's going to trickle down to their Gen Z and Gen A uh, grandchildren. You're at an inflection point of new consumers that are going to have a lot of disposable income at their hands. Right. So this wealth transfer that we're, you know, over the next couple of years, we're going to live through. I think is going to have a significant impact on new commerce models, new consumer segments, uh, and that is going to impact the CMO at a greater level. Yes, they need to focus on AI because that's the mandate from the CEO, right? But if they are missing, if they're not seeing kind of this, what's about to happen, they're going to miss the boat, right? Especially with luxury brands that you and I work with, like the high net worth individual, ultra high net worth individuals, what's about to happen is that a lot of those that were, let's say, uh, more... Um, you know, consumers that, that are more uh, inspired to potentially get the brand, they're actually going to be able to buy the brands. They're going to be able to kind of afford the brands, right? Um, and that opens, opens, I think, in this perspective, a new wave of opportunities for a lot of these brands on the retail front. Yeah, I mean, and, and building on this, I think what's mm -hmm. really challenging is for CMOs these days to be patient. Um, and yeah. I, I, I feel, and I've seen it with, you know, brands that come and go, come to the Roblox platform, then they drop out, they experiment. And one of the things I really appreciate about Elf Beauty, yeah. uh, not just because, you know, they're a partner at Super Social, but because they're, they're, they, come, they came in and they're sticking around. Walmart is another great yeah. example of a company that came and, and have sticked around. They're continuing to invest in the Roblox platform. And both of those companies are also yeah. experimenting and trying things outside in different platforms. And one of the things that are really important, I believe, for CMOs to recognize is either come and really invest the time and the capital to be a part of this evolution yeah. or don't even go in. Because just coming in and out is not only opportunistic, but also it's ineffective from a capital expenditure because you're going to put some money and then you're going to go out. And if you're not continuing, you're, gonna, you're really not going to take advantage of the learning that you acquired. Yeah. And I think that is where really the biggest challenge at the moment is that maybe they want to, but they're not putting the money. As you said, a lot of pressure, CEOs, they need to report in the quarterly earnings. Here is what we're doing in generative AI. I've just listened last night to Mark Benio from Salesforce. So he's saying that he's shocked by how many companies are training and building their own AI, retraining yeah. their own AI. And I think it's a similar in all of these emerging uh, technologies, anywhere from blockchain to AI to virtual worlds, it's really about how can you consistently experiment to build that understanding of what should be your big investment over time. But if you're not there, if you're not in the weeds every day, you're not going to gain the learning. And this is what surprises me with a lot of brands, a lot of companies in general, very much, very short-sighted for all the right reasons, but very short-sighted. And ultimately, the ones who, will, who are sticking around will yeah. probably benefit the most. A hundred percent. And I think there's a part here with the CMO, the tenure of the CMO has been reduced, you know, keeps keeps getting shorter and shorter, right? So the pressure for the CMO 
that's, that's, it's an interesting role for sure from a CMO perspective, right? I will say, so when you talk about something like Walmart, for example, I am good friends with the team there. I was their metaverse advisor in residence for about a year and a half. Um, I was one of the people that was critical in creating that relationship between Walmart and, and Roblox, you know, and big shout out to Justin over there. Who's one of the people I, Justin Breton, who's amazing, a uh, true visionary. So for example, what they did is when I worked with them um, as an advisor and then eventually as a builder through Journey and we created their first experience, they went in and they learned as much as they could about what works, what doesn't work, right? And eventually they shut down that world because they're like, okay, we learned what we needed to learn. We know we need to change and adapt and we need to do it differently, right? They shut down that world and then now they have uh, Walmart Reimagined or I'm not sure of the name right now. Which Walmart Discovered. Very, Walmart Discovered. Um, which has been a really amazing, I mean, I love going in there. I think it's a fantastic space and they're enabling these new commerce models, right? Where you start to buy physical goods. So they, in my perspective, are playing the long game. I think Justin and the folks at Walmart understand this is a long-term play. Um, this is where consumers are going. And I, I think wholeheartedly that their approach is going to pay off, uh, pay off in many different ways. So, so yeah, you know, uh, I, that being said, you know, yeah, I mean, a lot of people did activations one-offs they went in they got out etc i hope that many of them got great learnings from it and might come back but yeah i think the brands that are investing that are playing the long game that are taking all those insights and saying okay this didn't work but let's rebuild and do something else or how do we make what we have already better and adapt which is something that you know you keep doing with the brands you work with um i think is critical because it's not going anywhere gaming is the gaming experience the virtual world experience, the virtual commerce experience is going absolutely, it's, it's not going anywhere. It's only going to increase in importance, especially as you have Gen Alpha. This is an interesting piece of data, Jan, that I, I think it's important. By 2030, 10% of the workforce is going to be Gen Alpha, right? These are kids that have grown up with ubiquitous AI, with gaming. They played Roblox, like they bought things there. They spent their money there. That is, I mean, in my perspective, when you look at 2030, 10% of the workforce is going to be Gen Alpha. These are kids that are pretty much a Fortnite Roblox generation, right? Their perception of importance of value, what has value, where do I socialize? What is my social network? Where are my friends is going to change. So, um, so yeah, just sharing that because I think that's a really interesting piece of data that, un that underlies why that playing the long game is incredibly important for a company now and in the future. I agree. And I, I would, I would only add one more thing, which is, yeah, it's also gaming and what it means a game is really, really rapidly changing. Right. And, and I think it's very likely that over the next five, seven, 10, 15 years, gaming is not going to be just something that we think of, oh, you play a video game. Yeah. I think the, the lines are blurring between the gaming and just the overall, what it's going to feel like to experience a consumer yeah. internet. Right. And, and I think we've seen that trend with how social media moved from just being social media to essentially becoming the Internet and also educating corporations on how employees want to communicate. I mean, there is a direct line between Facebook and between Slack. That is that journey of messaging, communication, enterprise software look more consumer than ever before. And that's only going to grow. And, and, and I think it's not going to be too crazy to assume that the internet, the consumer internet, social platforms are going to evolve to feel more like a game. I like to say, I believe that, you know, it, we're not far from the day where every brand brand will have a live ops strategy. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're going to have to have a live ops strategy. It's not going to be enough to promote some <laughs> performance marketing and people go to my Shopify shop and they buy a shirt. And No, you're going to have to figure out how they're going to have a live ops strategy where they keep pushing content and they keep engaging. And it's, and the crazy thing, it's going to be all in. It's going to be 24, seven, 365. Yeah. They're going to have to constantly engage the community. Otherwise they're not going to sell jeans or t-shirts or makeup products. And that is why gaming is important right now, because yeah. you can learn the fundamentals of what it's like to run quote unquote live ops for a brand. And, and that's something that very, very few brands, recognize at the moment. And I think that's going to be a huge shift. But another thing is, as these kids grow up and become employees, they're going to push on whoever is the CMO. What are you talking about? Performance yeah. market? We, we got to, like 80% of our strategy got to involve social platform gaming. And look what's mm -hmm. happening with TikTok. Five years ago, yeah. no one was talking about TikTok. Yeah.
No, no, I, I completely agree with you. And I think, once again, it's a moment of convergence, right? And you bring up something really interesting, the future of the consumer internet. That's where I think there's a little bit of rebranding happening. If we're being 100% honest, right? All cards on the table. I personally have started to use the term spatial web a little bit more than metaverse, right? Because I think metaverse as a term has some baggage, right? There's a lot of feelings, a lot of people have, for some reason, very, like it just feels controversial to some people. I don't, I don't care about the word, whatever we end up using, it might just be the internet, right? But to me, the metaverse in essence is the successor state to today's mobile internet, whether it's spatial web or not. I feel like there is this rebranding moment right now, um, calling it the spatial internet or spatial web. And I do see that evolution, right? So if the, if the web becomes more spatialized, the more, you know, full of volume and understand and, and, and brought into the physical world, that in itself, massive impact, right? So, um, so I agree with you. I think gaming, this is funny because I was having a conversation the other day and said, like, I feel like every company is slowly becoming a gaming company. Do you remember at the early beginning of mobile, everyone was a tech company, right? Like WeWork was never I mean, the a internet. Company. Everyone yeah. was an internet company. In internet the company, right? WeWork to me was never a tech company, but whatever. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I feel like they're all starting to kind of chomp at the bit of gaming. The problem that we have here, though, which is a great opportunity for people like you and me, is that they're chomping at the bit. They want a piece of the gaming pie. But the people that are running these are ill-equipped to understand the gaming space because, A, they might not be gamers. They might not be in, in, tone, in tune with the culture. They might not understand the economics and the physics and the, the, how gaming works as a, as, a, as, as, a, as a sector, right? So I think that there is this moment, right, of huge opportunity for the people that truly understand these segments to come in and lead, right? Um, so yeah, 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 I feel like we're all becoming gaming companies. Gaming is something that, especially for um, people like us or for younger generations, it is something that they do on a constant basis, right? It is their social network. It is where they spend time with their friends. It is where they shop. It is where things of value are, where value is being assigned, right? So I think that in itself is a monumental shift in the mindset of who the consumer is, what the consumer wants. The consumer is still going to want to buy physical goods, right? The kid that is going to get a ton of money from his grandparents is still going to go buy the Gucci bag because they want to buy it and they want their friends to see it, but they're, might, they're probably going to want to buy that for their avatar as well. So I think that concept, another thing that I think is important to mention is some of the conversations I'm having, especially with governments, right? I do a lot of work, you know, in the private, in the, in the public sector as well, is this concept of virtual GDP, right? Physical GDP, there's a limit to that. There's only so much you can get there. The, con the fact that we're starting to figure out what has value, what in the virtual world has value, what do I own in the virtual world? What is a country's virtual GDP? The fact that there are countries in this world that are future forward, that are starting to ask themselves that question, to me is a huge signal of kind of where things are going to go and understanding the parallel path that virtual and physical worlds are going into the world. It's just going to be the world and it goes between vir vir virtual and physical. Um, so yeah, that, that is a concept I think needs to be explored, needs to be further researched. Um, and I mean, I feel, I feel lucky to be part of having these conversations, but what is virtual GDP? What does that even mean for a, for a country? Kathy, what's the one thing you're most excited about for the next 12 months? Oh my goodness. Um, so many things. I mean, I, I'm, I'm like involved in so many things. I think continuing to see how Gen Alpha impacts the marketplace, how they adapt, how they're using gaming, what they assign value to, continue to be excited about that. Uh, I'm an Apple Vision Pro developer, so I'm really excited to see how to push the technology a little bit forward. I'm excited to see what Meta brings to the market in September uh, from a hardware perspective. And yeah, I think we're going to see between the next six, six to 18 months, a Cambrian explosion of this convergence moment that we're seeing. Um, so not just large language models. I mean, I'm excited about that, but I'm excited about more stuff. And excited to see what you're going to continue building because you do amazing stuff. So, yeah. And then on a very, very, like, side note, I'm excited to see where space marketing goes. Space marketing is, like, something that I dabble in. So, yeah, I would say that's also keeping me really excited at the moment. All right. Kathy Heckel, so fun to have you. This was a blast. I hope and I'm sure everyone is going to enjoy listening and we'll do it again. We'll definitely, we definitely will. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Into the Metaverse. We hope you learned a lot and explored new aspects of the metaverse. 